Hi y'all, in this video I'll be responding to a video done by Riley J. Dennis titled Your Dating Preferences Are Discriminatory. It was brought to my attention by a YouTuber called Scratchpoint, linked to his excellent uh, video below. I will be mirroring many of his points. So anyway, uh, let's get on with this exercise in Kettle Logic. Take it away! Would you date someone who's trans? Would you date someone who's black? Would you date someone who's fat? Would you date someone who's disabled? Now, um, probably not for all four of those, but you could, extend, you could extend the list. Would I date a woman? No. Would I date a white man? No. I'm just not the dating sort, though, so it doesn't really say much. Although I will concede that it is discriminatory in that I am, you know, making a decision. I am distinguishing between two states of affairs. One I will engage in and one I won't. Now, um, if you want to get away from dating, because what you're actually talking about is attraction, would I have sex with some of the people on that list? Uh, perhaps, though I generally uh, like white guys. There are some black guys I would, you know, bang harder than Katrina did in New Orleans. That guy T being one of them. Hi T. Honestly, I don't know what your answer is to those questions, but I've met a surprising number of people who would say no to all or at least some of them. Their argument is that it's just a preference and that you can't control who you're attracted to. I think most of the time that this is brought up, it's in regards to race. I'll link to a couple really good videos in the description about racial dating preferences, but in this video, I want to talk about our other biases. Let's start with trans people. Would you date a trans person? Honestly? Think about it for a second. Okay, got your answer? Well, if you said no, I'm sorry, but that's pretty discriminatory. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I, I know, I discriminate against all kinds of people, like um, kids, those poor kids. I'm just discriminating against them, de uh, dehumanizing them, taking away their agency because I won't date them because I'm not attracted to them. And, oh, the poor elderly, those poor, you know, they're going to their deaths, not having the great opportunity to be dated by me. <laughs> Is there no limit to my evil? The dehumanizing part we'll get to later. I'm not saying you're a horrible person who hates trans people. There was probably a time in my life when I said I wouldn't date a trans person. But since Although I do kind of have to say on, on the kid front, it is kind of true that I don't like kids. Like, I really don't like kids. They're like so whiny. They're a lot like feminists. They're so whiny and needy and weak and useless. It's like, oh my god. Now I understand that the, uh, the, that the assembly line of people requires them, and it requires that there are people out there who just adore them and want to take care of them, and, and all I can say is more power to you. Uh, many happy returns. Then I've thought critically about it and changed my mind. I could sit here and show you photos of conventionally... I, I like this. As though the people to whom I'm attracted is an analytic exercise. Like, if I just thought more carefully about it, Suddenly, I could I could start to be attracted to you know some, you know, hey hey grandpa barely eighty one you know that's a website by the way y'all in case you didn't know I learned that from um, Jody Foster actually <laughs> putting that off to the side it's not an analytic endeavor as to what does and doesn't uh, you know blow my skirt up any more than what pieces of music I do and don't appreciate is an analytic endeavor any more than what books, uh, what plots I find stupid or smart. The ones that work for me and ones that don't, or phrasings of uh, various events in literature that, that get me choked up and other ones that don't. It's an emotional uh, reaction. It, it's not a logical one. It's not an affair of the logical parts of our brain. It's much, it's, uh, much more primal, much more basic than that. And you're, you're wired in particular ways or you're not wired in particular ways. Now, at the margins, you can do certain things to, to change aspects of that. But the core of what it is that you're into, uh, barring some kind of uh, you know, getting hit in the head or whatever, are going to be pretty static throughout your life. And they're going to, the, the basic principle, if you look at the distribution and the ensemble differences and the attraction that people have, Typically, people are most attracted to people who are most similar to them within their race and of the opposite sex within a fairly tight age bracket. Now, that isn't to say there aren't exceptions. There are. There are, you know, people, chronophiles of various types. Some are into old people, some are into kids. These are, you know, they're called paraphilias, which, contrary to what you say, does not bespeak, you say this later on, it does not bespeak a moral judgment, necessarily. It's typically an aesthetic judgment. Although, with respect to those who are unable to consent, like if you have uh, an affinity for uh, helpless people, uh, unconscious people, uh, young children, things of that nature, there is a moral component that goes with it. But that's, that's linked to the consent part, not to the attraction part. Uh, that's where that originates from. 
impact of trans people. There are definitely trans people who you would never know are trans unless they told you because they pass for cis. And that might convince some of you, but I think arguing... Ah, yes, but you know, clever thing about dating as opposed to just, you know, looking at someone and going, oh, attractive, is that it requires... It's, I know this is probably, like, so traditional of me. I'm so trad con today. I'm gonna start talking about traditional values of speaking to people. <laughs> I know. Wait, go with me here. This is for dating, though, not necessarily for sex. <laughs> yeah, there will be like these things called conversations, where in the past people have engaged in this activity to learn more <laughs> about another person, and that typically events of this type precede events of the dating type. You would only like a trans person if you didn't know they were trans is a poor argument. I think you could be attracted to any trans person, whether they pass or not. I think the main concern. <laughs> You think wrong if you think I can be attracted to any trans person. Maybe you can, but uh, I, I have limits beyond which I'm just not attracted. Like, um, no, I, I don't know who the hottest female model in the world is, uh, if, there is even, if, there, if that is even a concept uh, that has any purchase, but you can parade her around all day, all night, fully dressed in Victorian attire, which I love, uh, completely naked, which, uh, well, if it's a woman I don't love, uh, it's, <laughs> it's gonna do nothing downstairs. Nothing's happening. Uh, no matter how much, and believe me, you know, I grew up gay in the South, in, in the Bible Belt, I tried really, really, really hard not to be attracted to men. I, I worked at, I prayed, back when I was religious, you know, six. I prayed about it, I thought about it, I worked really, really hard. Uh, it, but for some reason, all my self-indoctrination and the social pressure and the religious pressure and all these other pressures just failed to do the trick. I don't think it's an analytic endeavor. People have... It, it isn't as though, like, if I just learned more about women, suddenly vaginas would be lovely. If I just learned more about the elderly, you know, saggy tips would really do it for me. It, it, it's just not gonna happen. In regards to dating a trans person is that they won't have the genitals that they expect. Because we associate penis... Yes, uh, you know, you, you might find this strange to believe, but... <laughs> Sometimes unexpected surprises in bed aren't a good thing. Other things that might make me, uh, you know, when things are getting hot and heavy, stop and think, you know, maybe I'm not really as into this as I, as I used to be, like if a person's like, I have AIDS! I'm like, wait, wait a second. I've thought about it, and I knew there was something about you I didn't like, and now you've told me. There are many things that a person could do that's going to alter whether or not I remain uh, interested in dating that person, let alone just having sex. <laughs> this reminds me of a joke. So this, uh, this guy goes on a date with this, this woman, and before he goes on the date, he's been told that the woman is actually transsexual, that's actually a man. And he's... After he'd accepted the date, but before he goes on the date, he's he this is when he finds this out, and he's really worried about it. You know, does it make me gay? Is this, you know, how weird is this? And what can I do to verify this, where I don't look creepy in case I'm wrong? And so, they're out, uh, you know, and hiking or whatever, and, and she says she has to excuse herself to go to the nearest tree, and he's like, "Aha! Perfect opportunity to check." because that wouldn't be creepy at all, sneaking up on people in the woods in the middle of the night. Anyway, so she goes off and she's doing her thing, and he stealths up there, and, and he's peeking through the trees, and then he sees her squatting down, and he's like, oh, it is a woman. And then as he turns, he sees, there it is, just hanging, and he's like, oh, fuck. So he sneaks, and he sneaks, and he sneaks. <laughs> and then he jumps out, and he grabs and he goes, I got you! And she says, Oh, I didn't know you were... I didn't know you were watching me. <laughs> to which he replies, I didn't know you had to shit. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that joke always gets me. I'm sorry. Just the visual. <laughs> you know, that has to make for an awkward drive back into town. <laughs> Actually, I'm starting to think your way. 
maybe this gay thing is an analytic enterprise. I was born straight. I was raised straight. But what happened was when I was a teenager, I just ran with a bad crowd and just got sucked into being gay. That's what did it. ...with men and vaginas with women. Some people think they could never date a trans man with a vagina or a trans woman with a penis. But I think that people are... You know, I'm going to extend this logic a little bit further. I had never contemplated until, you know, moments ago, dating like a car. But if I start thinking that cars have a penis, or don't have a penis, then it's irrelevant because a car can identify as whatever I want it to identify as because that may work for me, then I guess I could date a car. Now, of course, cars don't have agency, but that's completely irrelevant since uh, I don't look at them as potential dating material. In the same way, I don't look at most of the world as potential dating material. And certainly most of the world doesn't look at me as potential dating material, which is fortunate for them because I'm way out of your fucking league, rest of the world. More than their genitals, I think that you could feel attraction to someone without knowing what's between their legs. And uh, well, <clears throat> you may think that I can. Uh, having met me once or twice before, and having had a light conversation about this once over some, uh, some wine, I seem to recall what I said to myself that day is that actually, yeah, it, Justy, you know, you can't actually be attracted to someone without knowing what's between their legs. And when I heard me tell me that, I was like, you know what, me, you, us, we, our, we are totally persuaded. If you were to say that you're only attracted to people with vaginas or people with penises, it really feels like you're reducing people just to their genitals. You're kind of objectifying them, but you're thinking of them more... You want me to think of them as objects of my affection, and then you're going to complain about how I'm going about making people objects of my affection. This is the kettle logic. Look, I, now I had been told by feminists <clears throat> and social justice warriors, which you are, that objectifying people is bad. Make, you know, making them uh, to be objects in that way is, is bad. And yet, you're now saying that the people I'm not objectifying, which is to say people who aren't an object of my affection, now should properly be objectified in that way, but then complain that I'm not objectifying them in precisely the same way that you would prefer that I objectify them. You are a rather bizarre person. You've got some screws loose up in there. Or as genitals than objects, so I guess you're kind of genitalifying them? Anyway, my point is, we have implicit biases that we were raised with, or that we developed over time, and they can be hard to get rid of. And I think this can be especially prominent within the queer community. Gay men often pride themselves on being disgusted by vaginas, and the same goes for lesbian women with penises. It's difficult because some queer people have built their sexual identities on these repulsions, but I don't think they're innate at all. If you met someone who was extremely attractive, had a great personality, but didn't have the genitals that you wanted, you might be surprised to find that it isn't a deal breaker. As someone... <laughs> you might be surprised to find that it is. <laughs> Apparently, the only one who, here in this relationship that we have right now that's going to be surprised by <laughs> my disposition on these issues is going to be you. I am, I am entirely unsurprised who is trans and gay, sometimes people ask me, with a very accusatory tone, if I would date a girl with a penis. Because there's a stereotype that trans lesbians are just predatory cis men creeping on cis women. But the thing is, I absolutely could be attracted to a woman with a penis. I could be attracted to any woman, cis or trans. If I find you attractive, I don't care what you have down there. But we know that sexual orientations are more innate than learned. They're more nature and less nurture. Gay conversion therapy has been proven not to work. You know what? I'll meet you halfway. I can be attracted to a man with a penis who pretends to be a woman with a penis while still being manly. Is that good enough? Does that work for you? You can't. I'm trans by, 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 by trans. Unlearn your own prejudices. It just takes time and conscious effort. And the way that we talk about potentially dating trans people has a lot in common with the way we discuss other preferences. Saying that you're not attracted to fat people isn't innate. It's informed by a society that tells you that being thin is ideal. Everything in the media you consume is bombarding you with messages that skinny is beautiful and fat is ugly. And even the night. And and I look at a lot of what they show me in, in the media and call beautiful, and I go, mm, no, no, 
that's not doing it for me. Uh, I appreciate that everyone has an opinion on what it is I should and shouldn't find beautiful, but um, I think I'm going to take my own counsel exclusively on that particular subject, and I'll uh, thank you to stay the fuck out of my head. Of people absorb these messages to some degree. But again, if you find someone attractive and really enjoy spending time with them, there's no reason why their weight should be a factor. Especially since we know that the relationship between weight and health is extremely complex, and you really can't make any moral judgments on a person based on... You see, this is one of the problems with talking with assholes like you. You conflate aesthetics with morality. I'm not morally judging people. This is what I got alleged, uh, alleged, alluded to earlier with respect to kids. I'm not judging them as lesser than I am. They're not, uh, you know, like partial people. Like, oh, you're mostly human, but not quite there yet. I'm just not into you. Fuck off. How about that? It's not a moral proposition. It's an, it's an aesthetic one. And as we all know, there's no arguing taste. Wait. And lastly, let's talk about disabled people. Disabilities come in a very wide range. From I can hear an objection brewing in someone's head out there. Actually, by the law, children are lesser than adults. Then just transpose that to the elderly. They're fully adult. Fully, uh, Most of them are still in control of their faculties. Most. <clears throat> anyway, it's not a moral judgment on their age. I'm not, oh, you're a bad old per you dirty old bird. It's nothing like that. Just, I don't want to fuck you. And if I don't want to fuck you, the chances of our dating, of our getting to... Actually, you know what? We could have we could have a relationship like that. Let's have a long-term, or if it's an old person, a not very long-term, mutual agreement not to fuck each other, and we'll call that a date. Does that satisfy you? No. It's not a moral position, you nitwit. Being deaf to being in a wheelchair to only having one arm, and I think it's pretty ridiculous to say that you couldn't be attracted to any person who has any of those disabilities. Does it Here you're confusing attraction and dating. Now, in the ordinary course of affairs, attraction precedes dating, and then date, you know, dating goes on for a while and may or may not lead to something more serious. But there are stages of relationships, and typically, as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, they start out as you know being attracted to one another, and then you form uh, close personal bonds. But the thing with, with beauty, no matter how attractive someone is, it is fleeting. Beauty is fugacious. Unless you die early, you're going to, you're going to age, you're going to lose your youth, you're going to lose uh, that beauty, and what you need to do when you have it is to capitalize on it and find a relationship that is going to perdure. My brother and his wife have been married for, what well, if they're watching, uh, five years. They're very young. Still... You, Still spring chickens. They've been married for like 20 years. And I don't know how often uh, one of them walks in the room and says, All right, darling, tonight's the night, you hot thing. And then they you know, shag like teenagers again. I doubt that that happens. Uh, but they are at a stage of their relationship where it isn't, pri it isn't at the attraction stage anymore. Now they have a commitment to each other. They have obligations, duty. They're married. You know, these... I am sounding very traditional. I'm like a trad con today. So the, that, the beauty fades, and the health will fade as, as, you know, age, as age works its evil magic on us. And what they have will uh, you know, last as long as they do, so long as they keep that relationship in good repair. It is no longer based on, oh my god, he's hot, or oh my god, she's so hot still. They've had, they, you know, they met, again, if any, if any of her relatives are watching, uh, they met in church. They were both praying to Jesus like crazy, I, I promise. They met in a tattoo magazine ad kind of thing. They were they were the wild ch you know the, each of them was a kind of a wild child, and nevertheless they they got together and had two beautiful children. And I say that not because they're my niece and nephew, though they are, but you know they're both going to be heartbreakers when they're adults. Uh, they're both exquisite people too. They're very hardworking. My niece is just wonderful in in, in art. Uh, she's been selling her art since she's like ten. And my nephew made an Eagle Scout at 14, which is almost unheard of. Very, well, it's very infrequent that anybody makes Eagle Scout, but let alone at the age of 14. And he's a math whiz. They are hardworking, smart, intelligent, capable kids who you know, produced out of this very salacious, slutty meetup in the back of a <laughs> tattoo magazine. Back when my brother and, you know, now my sister-in-law, 
it sounds a little weird to say back when my brother and sister were hot, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Back when they were young and, you know, everyone thought they were just, you know, hot shit and they wanted to fuck like rabbits, and then they got married. So they are at that stage of the relationship where the attraction is faded. It's not at the dating stage anymore, filling each other out while you still have, you know, other options. They're, you know, this is it. <laughs> I've got to hang on to this for all it's worth. That's called maturity. Disabilities can happen to anyone. Someone you're extremely attracted to today could become disabled tomorrow. And that shouldn't make your attraction to them disappear. So whether or not, to use my brother and his wife, you can generalize this to any responsible people. Once you've been with someone it, for a long while and you've made a commitment to them, it no longer matters if they remain attractive or not. If they get in some uh, accident and lose a leg or they're burned in some horrible way. I mean, you, you see these stories all over the place. Uh, men come home from war and their wives never leave them. In fact, you know, they, their wives will look at their scars as a sign that they married a good, upright, brave, strong man. They chose wisely. It is not at that stage anymore about lust and, you know, physical attraction. It is about other, it is a more mature kind of relationship that you can't just reduce, except for in the most superficial kind of nitwits, which, as Oscar Wilde said, only the shallow truly know themselves. Anyway, it is no longer at that stage. This is important. Don't conflate attraction and, and relationships. Dating is not about being attracted to people. That's what got you there. Dating is about filling out whether or not this is the type of thing you want to invest in for the long haul, for once the beauty has faded, for once the youth is gone, for once the health has, you know, run away from the scene. Is this the person I want to be stuck with? If it does, it might not be because of them, but rather because you have some preconceived ideas about disabled people that are just inaccurate and harmful. Unsurprisingly, this is another case of the media telling you that a... You know, look, there are some disabled people I don't find attractive. There are some people, like, uh, there's a marine guy, an underwear model, lost a leg. I'd bang him like a black man and, you know, during the Katrina hurricane. He's hot. The fact he's missing a leg is of no moment to me. I still probably wouldn't date him, well, because he's straight for one, so the... Hell you know, inconvenient. What a bastard, pussy loving bitch. And for two, I'm not the dating kind of guy. And I'm not going to take advice from someone who's never been inside my head, and quite frankly, who lacks the mental firepower to be able to handle roaming around in my head. Uh, I'm not going to take advice from a person like that about what I do or should uh, find attractive, or don't or shouldn't find attractive. It's none of your fucking business. And more, more to the point, it's not within my bailiwick to go redefining what does and doesn't get my dick hard. Because no matter how much I try to persuade it, hey, listen, all right, little soldier, stand at attention. What? That car's not doing... That car has a penis. Didn't work. It's a hot Corvette. It's a hot little filly. Certain group isn't attractive. Disabled people are rarely romantic leads. Their stories in movies and TV shows are often tragic. But that doesn't reflect the reality that disabled people can be happy and have dating lives and be... As Scratch Point mentioned in his video, the reason that is so is because the enterprise of making movies is about making money. And so they want to, like, find angles and exploit that so they make more money rather than less. Only morons like you run around thinking that what you see in fiction is a mirror of life. Attractive. Now, if you're not attracted to someone, you're not attracted to them. I'm not going to tell you that you have to be attracted to this fat person or that trans person or that disabled person. But the more you work at unlearning... But you are telling me that I am, in some sense, required to consider people who fit into those categories, of which those particular people would be a, a subject of a predicate. I've got to consider the predicate of which they are the subject as a potential option. No, I don't. Go fuck you, you imperializing little cunt. Trans cunt your own prejudices, the more you'll be able to see people from these groups as people rather than tired stereotypes. See, this is what I was talking about earlier with the objectification. I see them as people, I don't see them as fuck objects. Who's the one who's doing the objectifying? It's you, not me. I'm trying to reduce the objectification of people in the world by, by constraining the number of people who I look at and go, God, I'd tear that up. I'd fuck that like a black man in Hurricane Katrina. I'm doing my part to end the objectification of peoples throughout the land. And unlike feminists, I'm not restricting it to just women. I have freed all the women's from my, my objectification and oppression, and most of the men. I've done my part for king and country, or queen and country, I guess. Wait, you're, are you boy to girl? Oh, I don't give a fuck.
Unlearning our own biases doesn't happen overnight, and I don't have a step-by-step -step instruction guide for you. But I think if you can accept that these prejudices exist in all of us, even you, you can identify them when they come up and work to change how you think about them. It will most likely be a long, slow process, but I think it's worth it. Because these dating preferences are- I have a long, slow process for you to entertain. It's called a walk, and it should be done on a short bridge. In heels ultimately harmful to people who don't fit into your box of what a conventionally attractive Listen here, you rape apologist. Who does and doesn't get in my box is my business. My body, my ch Oh, category. <laughs> carry on, carry on. And looks like it makes people feel isolated, alone, and unwanted to hear that they're universally unattractive to people. I don't think there's anyone out there who somebody doesn't find attractive. These people should take a little bit of advice about how the world works. Uh, a good piece of it comes from Eleanor Roosevelt. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And once, and another piece, I forget who said it now. Once you realize how little the rest of the world actually thinks about you, the better off you're going to be. So this image of the conventionally attractive person, but in reality, all kinds of people around the world are constantly dating, having sex, finding people attractive, getting married. It's not only the conventionally attractive who find love or have sex. So by working on ourselves to dispel that idea, we can- Then apparently they don't need me to pick up some slack, bitch. <laughs> they got game all over the world the world a more welcoming and loving place for everybody, no matter how they look. This video is a part of my feminine- What does one have to do with the other? They're not unwelcome. They're just not gonna- They're just not getting a load out of me. That's all- that's all we're talking about. My god. I'm with Riley series that I'm doing in collaboration with Everyday Feminism, a website dedicated to helping you stand up to and break down everyday oppression. Be sure to give this- That is extremely- Exceedingly ableist. Miss just talking about the disabled and now you want to get to help people stand up? Oh, yeah, come on, Stephen Hawking, get out of that goddamn chair. Stand up for your rights. Give a like if you enjoyed it, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos about various feminist topics. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> Have a great day, everybody.